broadcasting from Orchard Park, New York, and Boca Raton, Florida, it's the Freight 360 Podcast. From freight broker sales tips to sports talk, this podcast is all about helping you grow as a freight broker. We're your hosts, Nate Cross and Benjamin Kowalski. Let's talk freight. All right, welcome back for another episode of the Freight 360 Podcast. If you're brand new, you caught us at a good seasonality-related episode. We're going to talk about produce today with our guest. We'll get to him in just a second here, but please make sure to hit that subscribe button, leave that review, leave a comment on YouTube, share us with all your friends in the industry. Uh, and if you'd like to learn more about Freight 360 and all the training and uh, options that we have, check out the Freight Broker Basics course a full-length, self-paced course taught by myself and Ben, how to start a brokerage, find new customers, build a carrier network, and even hire the right employees. So um, normally, we start off with an ad read for Blue Book, but who better to have on here than Jeff Lair? He's back with us again for probably like, what, fourth or fifth episode now, Jeff? Three, I think, you guys. Third? Okay. <laughs> well... I know. You're back by popular demand. So we're all, uh, I know you're on a... You're on a uh, a time crunch here. So we're going to get right into the content here. And then uh, Ben and I will, will pick up afterward after you hop off with our, our sports and our news and everything else related. But uh, we're, we're mixing it up this week. I like it. It's good. Um, and Ben, how are you, man? I got to at least say hi. Doing well. Living the Perfect. dream, buddy. All right. One well, day at a time. Jeff. So we're in September now, right? It's, it's fall and we're going to see the leaves changing colors and all that good stuff. And, um, Pumpkins and apples. Um, where do you want to start with this let's, one? Let's let's take it. Let's take it with the apples. You know, let's go with the apples because that's that's rocking on on East Coast, Midwest, and West Coast as as we head into the, the fall season. So let's take take it with apples. And you know, for your listeners and and for the benefit of the newbies as well as the veterans on the on the brokerage side, you know, apples is a big commodity. Um, you know, we list over 550 grower, shipper, and importers of apples. And the majority of those companies are handling domestic, but there's also importing. You know, when, when, when the season starts to wind down here in, in I'll just say the United States, um, you know, you can get apples coming from Ch Chile, South America. And I even think they come up from South Africa. So, so you've got those, those areas that are also producing apples. Um, and don't forget our Aussie friends, I, I believe Australia and New Zealand too. So, you know, but for the most part th in this session, we just want to talk about apple grower shippers that truck brokerages can pursue for loads of, of apples, uh, in these, these key States, which I'm just going to break it down. Is that all right? The key States that I yeah, see. Yeah, I just want to say first looking at, so I'm looking at the know your, know your commodity, uh, that apples page. Mm -hmm. And it shocked me. I didn't realize how year round app apples were available in certain yeah. states yeah. Uh, domestically. And I also didn't know a lot of them came from like China, Chile, yes. Argentina. That, that, that all blows my mind. But mm -hmm. go ahead. Yeah, continue on. Yeah. So all that, as you noted, is in our Know Your Commodity information on our ProduceBlueBook.com website for seasonality. So if you're if you want to do international and, and obviously there's container loads of apples coming in on international level from those respective countries like Argentina, Chile, New Zealand, as I mentioned here um, earlier. I, read a I wanted to read a couple of the headlines from this too. I thought were interesting, right? Sure. That apple trees, uh, that one of the most recognized and beloved fruits in America, as well as the rest of the world. During colonial times, the fruit was often called the winter banana. Never mm. heard that. That's new. And despite their popularity in America, apples can be found in European archaeological records dating back to before the Greeks, all the way back to like ancient times along mm. the Silk Road. Wow, I like, didn't realize they went that far back. And that there's 100 different varieties grown commercially in 36 yeah. different states. Yeah. You know, our industry is, 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 is rocking it um, on apples. In the varieties that are available, you think about some of the varieties that you know you may have grown up on as a kid. If you're an apple, if you're an apple connoisseur, but like Golden Delicious, Red Delicious, Granny Smiths, which are great for for pies, but they're and they're a tart apple. Um, and you know, in your state, 
Nate of New York. You've got like Cortland, as in Cortland, New York. You've got. Oh, I'm assuming Empire probably comes from New York. It's the Empire State, yeah, right? Yes, and you know, and there's specific varieties to specific states, which is which is pretty amazing too. But it's it's and it's pretty cool. But you know, the Honeycrisp that's been out for for a number of years. The pink they're lady. so expensive for some reason too. Honeycrisp. I never understood. My wife loves Honeycrisp apples, and they're like, I, I swear, they're like three times as expensive as like some of the other apples in the grocery store. But yeah, and I yeah. think, and I don't know all of the reasons why behind that. I'd have to, I'd have to ask my marketing friends on the apple side, the grower shippers on the apple side. Obviously, it's a popular apple, so I think it can command a higher price because your your wife is going to probably say, "Hey, let's put the money out." Because here's the thing, taste is huge. In, in anything that you we eat, and if if you like it, you'll pay for it, and if it's yeah. good for you, you'll pay for it. So why not? And and to me, I mean, obviously there's a, there's a limit on that, but candidly, I'll pay more if if you've got a good peach, a good apple, a good tomato that tastes great, and it's a flavor bomb, and it's and it's you know in in, in the words of Guy Fieri. Diners, drive-ins, and dines. What's he say? He says something like flavor. Oh, I'm drawing a blank on it, but tune in and watch one of his sessions. Well, you're right. So I, and I just, it, on the Know Your Commodity page, I scrolled down to like the Apple retail pricing. This is organic per pound, and it's got honey. So the, the, the la, this chart went through um, May of 22, and it shows the honey crisp organic was about $5 a pound versus like $2.50 a pound for gala or red delicious so it's literally yep. double the price mm -hmm. for an apple yeah. and it's not always double the chart will show you that check it out if you're curious but it's always been it's higher than the other two yep. consistently so yes but you're sir. right people pay yes, for what sir. they like right yes sir and, and to me if, if it's rocking the flavor bomb it's a mouthful of love you're gonna pay for it and anyway so to just highlight a couple things here real quick on, on the apples as, as far as seasonality and where they're coming from, you know, it, it, as far as Blue Book companies, companies that are listed on Blue Book Online, and if you did a search, there's over 75 uh, grower shippers out of Washington State. New York, your home state, Nate, has 68 grower shippers. PA comes in with 28, Pennsylvania. Michigan 16, Oregon's up there too. They're they're at 17. So there's a from what I see the top 5 major grower sh states of grower shippers of apples. Um you know Ohio has a representation of about 8 mini Minnesota has 5, Wisconsin 5. But even as you look on our seasonality chart, um I didn't mention Virginia. They're in there. North Carolina, they're in there. So and, and some of these these states have year-round apple supply. So for, for the listeners that are out there, you know, there's definitely opportunities on a seasonal basis and even year-round for apples, but I'd say more fall than it is. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, if you just, just basic pencil or uh, napkin math there, if you're prospecting apples, you, you just listed off hundreds mm -hmm. of potential prospects for one commodity alone, which I think is huge. Mm -hmm. So you got it. Good deal. Cool. Let's switch gears to pumpkins, if that's okay. Let's do it. It's almost uh, Halloween season. Yeah, I don't so know we're, what we're happened about this summer this year. It flew by, but what do <laughs> so we got with six, pumpkins? Yeah. And then, hey, I'm looking at the chart on Know Your Commodity, and I'm going to try to put a an image on the screen for YouTube people watching that will show this. Um, not nearly as available year-round as Apple, but what do we got for pumpkins? Yeah, but I think, too, what's pretty cool in this, too, is look at the states. Like, So Illinois, my home state right now, they're the largest producing state of pumpkins in the nation, um, which is pretty amazing when you think about the, the land of Lincoln here, the Midwest, but especially south of us, below Chicago, Springfield, which is our, our state's capital, it's a huge farming area. And even up here, there is, to a certain extent, a lot of row corn, also some sweet corn, um, but but pumpkins is huge from the state of Illinois. But here's here's the kicker on this is I did a little bit of research on the number of companies that we have published on Blue Book Online. There's about 140 plus grower shippers of pumpkins. And as I see it right now, Illinois comes in with five grower shippers, but I wouldn't necessarily 
Um, look at that as a, a negative thing, even though we're the largest producer of pumpkins, because probably those five are, 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 are huge as far as volume of pumpkins go. And I know one of them specifically down in Keene, Illinois, they, they grow a lot of pumpkins and you see them in your retail grocery stores. Um, but like in, in New York state, there's eight companies that handle pumpkins. Um, PA six, Colorado three. So Michigan, yeah, I think I mentioned that eight, Washington seven. So over 140 pumpkin grower shippers that are available to pursue on Blue Book Online or through a mobile app. Um, but then also, as you know, on the note, no your commodity information, there's California also handles pumpkins, which we didn't mention. Um, and you even have pumpkins coming up from Mexico. Now, I'm not sure how much of that is out there. I don't know that that metric, but. You know, they're also producing pumpkins and I mean, they do a lot of squash, edible squash, but, uh, so that's kind of the pumpkin overview. Which then obviously if it's coming up through Mexico where it would impact our listeners is when, when it crosses the border, right. And then it ha it'll get transported mm -hmm. North, whether it's crossing yeah. into Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, whatever the, you know, California. Right. Rio Grande be. Valley down, down there would be a crossing Nogales. Chula Vista, California area too. So that's a, that's an opportunity. But you know, pumpkins. You, you know, it's you know we talk about fall. I think I think before Labor Day, you know, our, our infamous uh, coffee national pumpkin coffee spice program. lattes. There you go. Just, pumpkin, yeah, was, everything. Yeah. everything. I was just sitting there laughing in the back of my head. I'm like, I see people <laughs> start posting now in August. Like you can keep your pumpkin spice stuff to yourself until after Labor Day because summer isn't over yet. But as wow. soon as that day kind of transitions into the day after, it's like yeah. everybody's hey, pumpkin, pumpkin spice. Uh, K cups for my Keurig in August. So I'm I'm uh. It is what there it is, go. guys. Get over it. But you know, no, I'm, with, I'm, I'm with you, but you know, it, but look at this. I mean, to me, it's just a, it's just a fantastic opportunity for the fresh fruit and vegetable industry because look how much pumpkin is out there, and even pumpkin pie. I mean, we talk about apples and apple pie. There's pumpkin pie. I mean, there's, and yeah, I mean, even like I know in Trader Joe's, there's seasonal um, breakfast bars that are pumpkin, and I buy them not all the time, but I like them. And then some of these other. Breakfast bar manufacturers come out with like a ginger ginger spice. That's that's nice as well. But anyway, it's 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 the season, and so let's maximize it. And uh, you know, as far as I know, volume overall should be pretty good for both apples and pumpkins. But um, you can also check produceBlueBook.com because I know there's been some some news that we've published on both well for sure apples and what we're looking at as far as far as volume goes. But uh, yeah, well, good deal. Um, well, Hey, we can, uh, we can let you sign off now, Jeff. We appreciate the update and we'll have you on again. Um, yep. I think at least in our time this year, we'll talk about um, 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 to, to make it um, four, four, four more. Right. So, so wishing you guys well, and I realize we've got NFL kickoff Yeah. You know, on what Thursday night or are you doing Thursday or is it tomorrow or is it tonight? This September, so we're recording this September sixth. Currently, September seventh right. is the uh, opening week for is uh, his first game. It's Kansas City, Detroit. So by the time this airs, that game will have passed. Um, who are you taking though? Taking the Chiefs? I would take the Chiefs for sure. Yeah. No. Now, yep. who, now your your Bills are playing the Jets, correct? That's correct on nine eleven at 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 Orchard Park. No, it's going to be in New York. There you go, Orchard Park. You know, apples. They have they have apples in Orchard Park. Um, literally Orchard Park is called Orchard Park because it used to be a bunch of apple orchards. There Funny you go. story. There, so. you, there you go. Same uh, with O'Hare Field. It's O-R-D. It was an or apple orchard before it was an airfield. Uh, so, so wish you guys well. We're, we're, the Bears are kicking off against the Green Bay Packers. So hopefully we'll get a W. It's at home. No longer uh, our, our friendly nemesis who says, we got you, Aaron Rodgers. He's he's now on on the, the New York Jets against the Bills. So we'll see what if he's got the Bills this time. <laughs> I don't I don't think so. Here. All right, we'll definitely have Jeff on again um, later this year to go over some more commodities. But Ben, let's let's zoom out a little bit here. And um, obviously, there's a you know we, we just clearly those two commodities alone, hundreds and hundreds of prospects in the Blue Book uh, database, yeah. but. Think about seasonality in general, right? What are some different ways besides just calling a, an apple farm or an apple orchard, right? So what does that look well, like? 
Correct. And, and I want to go through even how I kind of learned this and where my prospecting led me, right? And it's when I first started doing the same things, you want to ask a lot of questions, even if you're talking to the farm and shipper level, right? Like, where do they go from there? So you don't ever want to get off the phone with a prospect before asking where they're delivering to if you got enough rapport to get that type of conversation going, right? Because you'll learn very quickly that like, that's where they all start, obviously, the farm. But then Sometimes they go maybe directly to a distributor. Sometimes they go to a co-op where lots of smaller farms pull their produce together and then they get shipped out of a distribution center. Sometimes they go directly to a manufacturer that turns it into another product like canned pumpkin. Some will turn it into other products like the ingredients, I'm sure, that somehow arrive in pumpkin spice lattes at Starbucks, yeah. right? So really we really point. did... Yeah. So we outlined, I think the very beginning, which is a great place to start and is a great opportunity to find shippers within Produce Blue Book. But by all means, the supply chain does not end where it begins, right? Like it's going to start here. And there's so many other commodities you can ship related to pumpkins and apples that are going to be going gangbusters through the fall. And I want, I want to add in here too. So Blue Book captures a lot of the large growers, right? There are a lot of smaller growers that are opportunities that you don't want to necessarily miss out on. So for example, and, and I'll just kind of, I'll broaden the conversation because this happened last year with Christmas trees. And um, I, my wife and I went to get a Christmas tree from our like local nursery. And I asked like, Hey, where do you guys get your trees from? And it was, it was a small place, but the, it, they had a lot of the same issues that the big ones did. They were very expensive last year. They were delayed coming in all kinds of um, just issues supply chain wise. But if you look at pumpkins, go to your local farmer's market or your uh, produce stand in, in your town, or if, if you have one that sells pumpkins, they don't, they're not going to necessarily come from one of these large growers that you might see in uh, a blue book listing. It could be a smaller mom and pop, style farm that guess what they still have the same transportation need of the big ones just on a different scale and if you can get in their ear before that harvesting season starts that's where you start planting seeds no pun intended with these smaller shippers right because i would be willing to bet like he mentioned um new york state has like 68 uh, apple growers i can tell you in Western New York alone, there are probably a dozen, if not two dozen different places you can go to pick your own apples, right? And you know, so, they're selling them too. It's a staple you, of all here. What you just said, right? Like I grew up in the Northeast, right up in Pittsburgh and PA and my birthday's in October. So like Halloween was always like one of my favorite holidays. Well, it's because your birthday is a little kid, but also like dressing up. But the biggest things I remember, right, of all of my time there is every fall, right? It was going to the apple orchards, going to the pumpkin farms and doing like the hay rides around them because yeah. they usually have those in the fall. And I'm like, every single one, I'm like, I can name like five outside of Pittsburgh that we would see every year. Some were really large, some smaller, but all of them had open air markets. And I can assure you they were growing way more pumpkins that are ever sold than out of their local little store there, right? So they're absolutely shipping into other places. Yep. And there's lots of opportunities with all of them. Like, do you go to you know, their apple orchard still up in Orchard Park? Um, I don't think in Orchard Park there is. There it But in the in the areas, oh, I mean like, Oh, in the area, Brooklyn? absolutely. Yeah. But like as so Orchard Park is a suburb of, we're basically like, yeah, we're a suburb of Buffalo. So over time, as you know, we used to be a rural area a hundred years ago, right? When the town, or I don't even know when it was started, probably 1800s. But um, now that metro areas expand outward, now we're a suburb. You got to go further out to get to the rural areas where there's going to be farmland, where they're, you know, like in Western New York, we have, if you go to the rural areas, there's cornfields, there's um, cattle farms, there's, uh, obviously I said apple, pumpkins, um, all like all, anything that's being grown. I used to live on a farm in a, in a rural area that they, yeah. every year was something different, but sometimes it was pepper. Sometimes it was cucumbers. Um, it just depended on what they were going to use that field for that year. But, uh, I guess 
the whole point of the seasonality thing here is that it's you're not limited to just the big ones. Um, Blue Book's a great place to start, and definitely the Know Your Commodity tool is going to arm you with the knowledge and information you need to go start prospecting a certain um, type of commodity that's out there. So, like when you read off that history about apples, I had no idea about any of that. I've also never done anything with shipping apples. We had a broker in our company a couple of years ago that did apples and it blew my mind when he was telling me how there are certain um, types of apples that, and he would do it like in Oregon and uh, Washington state of the whole Northwest area. Well, they can essentially, um, I don't know what the word is, but they can like hibernate the apples so they can be available year round under certain conditions. So they can harvest them one time in the fall and then they go to like this storage area. And I don't know if like they inject them with something or they just have the certain conditions, but they basically, it pauses the ripening process. And I never would have known that had I not heard it from him and then you could do research on it. But that's the kind of stuff that you can find out from uh, Produce Blue Book. But Here's a few. Seasonality, unless you got anything you want to add, I wanted to talk more about seasonal stuff. Yeah, here's some few more. Like I just, again, real quick, threw something into Bard to see what are the top selling products that include pumpkins, right? Like just for some ideas. The one we talked about comes up first. Pumpkin spice latte. Then you got pumpkin pie, pumpkin bread, pumpkin muffins, pumpkin cookies, pumpkin spice latte creamer that you buy. I know they sell at Costco. Um, pumpkin spice cereal. Pumpkin spice yogurt, pumpkin spice gum. Now, here are some other donuts, ice cream. It, 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 it all exists. Right. Dried pumpkin, pumpkin puree, pumpkin seeds, pumpkin soup, right? And again, I know everyone might think first, it's like, oh, those are all the things you could make with a recipe and a pumpkin. Yes, but now walk around a grocery store. And in the next week or so, you will start seeing these things everywhere, right? And when companies ramp up- If you don't already see them, I'm already starting to see them pop up. Yeah. And when companies ramp up to change gears, right? Like they need quantities of raw materials to come in, right? So maybe it isn't even from the shipper side. Maybe you can look at it from the demand side. Like which companies are using these as raw materials that you could maybe help ship them? And the better you understand the commodity you're prospecting, the better conversations you can have to actually become a trusted partner to work with them as a broker to move these loads, right? And if you can understand the differences, and I'll go back to the Apple one, there's so many different varieties in apples. There's probably quite a few in pumpkins, but I mean, if you can just really understand the difference in the apples you're shipping, which ones are fragile, which ones have more risk for temperature change versus the hardier ones, you're going to have a much better conversation with a person you're trying to get some business with because that's the business they live in. They live talking about apples. They work in a company that talks about apples all the time. So if you can speak their language, you're going to have a far better chance at doing business with them if you understand what's important to them, not what's important to you. Let me add in here too, pumpkin. Pumpkin beer, right? I don't know. Maybe that's just a regional thing, but no, like... uh... I don't know. Do they have any nationwide ones? Anyway, the the story I want to tell here is um, one of the brokers in our company, she does a lot of uh, beer, right? So she's got year round beer that's, you know, just ships all the time, but it is fall beer season for her right now. And so um, I won't name any of her customers, but they're places that sell pumpkin owls or different kinds of pumpkin uh, beers that they become usually in demand right around September. Sometimes we even see them in like August. You start to see them popping up on the shelves. But a big part of the fall in her experience, especially in the Northeast and other parts of the country that have a, a very defined fall, is things like, like we, we already talked about, you know, picking apples and apple cider and hard apple cider that a lot of local places will make. But pumpkin beers, um, all that stuff. But she had to prospect this customer months ahead of time, right? This is not like, yes. so it's good that we know when stuff's going into harvest, but what you should be thinking about is how do I get ahead of that? You can call right now and, and establish a relationship, but you're not going to have as much free time or your customer is not going to have as much free time to talk as they would before harvest time. Two points. And I was going to say this at the lead in, but Jeff had some other commitments. So we kind of got into it a little sooner than we normally did. But what I wanted to say is I know a lot of people that follow our channel, right? And just the way YouTube and podcast content works is 
This video will likely be watched in the winter of this year, in the spring of 2024, in the summer of 2024, and back to when we're in the season again. And what I want to say for anybody listening to this outside of this time frame is what Nate just said. There are two strategies to getting your prospects, and they involve two different approaches. One is you've got to build some relationship and rapport with them long ahead of their need. That is a different type of conversation. That is understanding and asking somebody, let's say, you know, somebody's season is January. I might start calling them now knowing full well they won't need me, but I'm going to ask them, you know, how was your shipping last year? What are your expectations for this year? How's the harvest looking? What are the things or things you're concerned about? Very high level conversations to build some rapport. If I'm talking to them when the season starts, my conversations are going to be around how have things been going, right? What are you looking at? Are you having any issues related to getting things out of the farm or to your customers? Because again, the approach is long-term, like you said, you call somebody off season, you got to talk to them for a few months. You got to talk to them six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 times over three or four months for them to know or trust you enough to tell you anything of real value. And then the other is more of the ambulance chasing. When things are in season, things have to move or people lose money. They are moving at a far different pace than they are off season. So when you do this, you want to understand when and which approach you're going with before you pick up the phone. That's a really um, good point. Take um, a break. DAT read. A little shout out to our affiliate partners. Tired of struggling to find accurate rates in the right carriers for your freight? With DAT1, you can access more than 500 million posted loads and trucks every year. That's three times more capacity than any other load board. Plus, their integrated freight management system makes it easy to cover loads 24-7. They have the most trusted network of carriers, brokers, and shippers in the industry. You'll get real-time rates on every lane so you know exactly how much a shipment will cost before you commit to it. Plus, you get instant access to top bids from qualified carriers around the country. Take advantage of a free month of DAT1 when you visit the link in the show notes. Absolutely. And this episode is also brought to you by Lean Solutions Group. Is your freight brokerage hiring? You've got to check out Lean Solutions Group, the industry leader in nearshore staffing for logistics companies with offices in South America, Mexico, and the Philippines. They offer a wide range of roles from back office operations to web development and marketing. Partner with the best. Visit www.leangroup.com to learn more. That's L-E-A-N group.com. All right, getting back into seasonality and produce. Um, if you, we just gave you an idea of what, you know, maybe you heard this in the future, right? Let's let's talk about other stuff that's seasonal in the fall or leading into the winter time, right? So obviously pumpkins and apples are they're massive. They're like a staple of Thanksgiving, right? You get apple pies and pumpkin pies. How about turkey, right? Turkey's like the number one thing. And there's a surge of shipping frozen turkeys that leads up to Thanksgiving. Um, what are some of the other big ones? Well, here's, I mean, some big ones before we even jump to Thanksgiving, right? Like, I'm curious how much is spent on Halloween per year? massive numbers, right? Like the first one that comes to my mind is Spirit Halloween. Spirit Halloween does literally pop-up stores the size of department stores where they need to ship all of the inventory in and ship it all of it back out at the end of it, right? So you've got time constraints, you've got opportunity costs, the stuff that they don't get there, they can't sell until next year. And again, that number is $10.6 billion is spent on Halloween every year, whether that's costumes, candy, decoration, or events. So I actually uh, know a guy that uh, does the Halloween pop-up. So I think it's like, I think it's Spirit owned by like Spencer's or something like that. But anyway, yeah, I, think, I think they one, are actually. One of the things that he does is those pop-up stores. Literally, he, they will basically has store in a trailer well a bunch of trailers right they go they drop it all off and this is everything not just costumes but like the shelving and the racks and yes. like the tables where the cash register goes these are like mobile stores that pop up but again plan in advance the same thing happens with fireworks on the fourth of july um the same thing happens with you name it for before any big holiday if there's any kind of seasonal stuff that happens there it's it's like Christmas is December 25th every single year. Don't be surprised when there's a surge in, in shipping of 
consumer goods the you know the four weeks right. prior to that well and here's the thing right like the reason this quarter is such a usual boon to shipping is because of the holiday season everybody thinks christmas and black friday but the reality is is it's all of them right and again these might not sound like huge numbers but they're per person for the united states so the the average spend for costume $36 per person, candy, $27 per person, $18 on decorations, $15 for events. Like those are the big categories and, and they're enormous, right? Like, so again, when you think about this for a company, right? Like they have these tight windows where they've got to sell all of this product or they don't sell it at all. Like nobody's buying Halloween branded Snickers bar around Thanksgiving. <laughs> they're not certainly not buying them when they're going to put them out for Christmas. All the little pumpkins and the little bats and everything. You've got to get it there and get it sold or your window closes. You're not selling yeah. them next year. So you've got huge reasons for these companies to spend what they need to, to get these products to where they need to be, when they need to be there, or they don't make any money, right? These are huge numbers. The other thing I want to say on this too, and this is more big picture, if you're dealing with seasonal commodities, whether it's um, something that's grown like or, uh, pumpkins or apples, or if it's a consumer good like Halloween costumes or it's Christmas trees, whatever it might be, right? Yes, there is a lot of opportunity for really good sales and margins because of the time sensitivity of it. But business planning, don't forget that the rest of the year, you're going to have lull, right? So you might have like four different peak shipping seasons throughout the year based on your book of business, but you've got to plan business wise to try and fill in those gaps around it. I have seen people, <clears throat> I had a guy that, and I won't tell his story too much because he might listen to this, but he had a, a commodity that he shipped that was seasonal. And literally at the end of the season, he had nothing to do until the next year and was like looking for work. And I'm yep. like, oh man, like, the, you know, it wasn't like a, you know, people, if as long as you, you budget your time and your money and the stuff the right way, you're going to be just fine. Uh, I know people, I know plenty of people that operate that way in freight, but, um, it's kind of like, I've seen people that just get surprised. Like, whoa, what do I do now? Yep. I got to wait six months until the next time that this product is, is shipping. What if I don't have any money or what now I, I got to go prospect and Oh, the market's super loose right now. Nobody's wants to bring on new brokers. Like it, it is a really poor business planning move to not core, you know, not plan for that. I totally agree. And I want to talk a little bit more about that. I, I looked up a number too, as you were talking, cause you mentioned spirit Halloween. So spirit Halloween, yes, is owned by Spencer's, but here's the numbers that are crazy is that not only are they enormous, but Spear Halloween is technically one of the largest retailers in North America because they have a total of 1,450 locations, basically, that pop up. So a massive number that does over a billion dollars in revenue as of 2021. So this is two, three years ago, right? Like, And again, imagine what it would take to open 14 or 1500 stores the size of a grocery store or a target right for a three month period and to have to sell through as much inventory as you can in that amount of time right to your point from that company standpoint like that is a that is a logistical accomplishment compared only to what like i could think of in like the military where you need to mobilize this amount of shipments in this short amount of time and get them back out, right? Because yeah. every day they're still sitting there, you're paying for that lease, which means you're running and eating into your profits. Yeah. So again, like huge incentives to have things shipped the way they're supposed to, when they're supposed to, and when they need to. But you brought up a really great point, which is most of, season, most of shipping is seasonal, right? Almost everything is seasonal to some degree or another. And if you're not keeping an eye on that, you really don't have a well-balanced or diversified book of business. And what that means is, just like you pointed out, I mean, it could be raining money for two or three months out of the year where you feel like everything's right. But when that season's over, you're not just going to be able to make a phone call and the next customer you want to talk to is going to all of a sudden give you enough loads to pick up the next quarter. So you've got to think through some of these things, I think when you're starting, but definitely once you're starting to move freight and to think about what season is this shipper and customer I'm working with now 
going to need me the most? And inversely, when will they need me the least? And yeah. what can I prospect that can fill in that gap? The other thing too, um, it, like apples, for example, if you look at the know your commodity availability, somewhere they're available all year round. Yes. So you can move around throughout the country throughout the course of the year and continue to be moving apples consistently. You can't say the same for pumpkin, but likely if you're if you're moving pumpkins, you're also moving something else throughout the year, squash or anything else that is this, you know, potato, something that's similar as far as its storage requirements and, and the temperature conditions. Um, and now I want to go through, I just, I pulled up a list of seasonal products that every single fall, right? We can expect these to be in higher demand. So I want you to think through these things and I didn't even think about some of them and they, they're like obvious and then backwards plan, right? Backwards plan next year to prospect these commodities in the early summer and throughout the summer before these become high demand. All right. So your seasonal uh, products that ship most in fall. We started off obviously with produce, pumpkins, gourds, apples, pears, grapes, citrus, and cherries are all popular fall produce items that are shipped from farms to grocery stores and markets. Um, I don't even know what a gourd is. Do you? Uh, I, a gourd, I think, I think a pumpkin is a gourd. Oh, okay. Um, but so anyway, produce. We already talked about produce, um, obviously with Jeff earlier on. But next, and this is you know kind of obvious, holiday stuff. And this goes all the way down to wrapping paper, the ribbon, the packaging, decorative tins, chocolate, any other holiday merchandise. Uh, those all start to ship in the fall in preparation for that holiday peak season. So that's a huge one. I, I want to point out something too, right? And this shouldn't be news to anybody, but clearly the Christmas Christmas season gets extended and extended every year. Every right? year. The it's longer earlier. you can convince people to shop, the more money they hope that we all spend. But something else happened, right? Like was during the pandemic, there was a fear and a, re a reality that we weren't going to be able to get the inventory in time to have to purchase for the season, right? So not only do you have that happening, but in addition to that, we had this temporary thing where we started shipping things way sooner, right? Like literally June and July to bring things in for, you know, the Christmas season. But the same thing is happening with every season, whether it's Valentine's Day, Christmas, Thanksgiving, or Halloween, right? Like we were talking earlier in this episode, you were buying K cups that were pumpkin spice in August, in August. right? Yeah. So, I mean... The more that that is happening, right, just want to point out is the earlier you want to start prospecting. Because if these yep. companies, if you're seeing them on the store shelves, they were manufactured and shipped long before they were here. And they were discussed in those companies long before that happened. So when yeah, you really think about that, you're talking months ahead of this, right? Like, the reality is, is most retailers were talking about what inventory levels they would have at Christmas around July, probably even in June, right? They were planning and trying to understand and the buyers are working on those. They're doing the same thing with every other commodity, right? So produce, you've got really predictable like lines when they'll come to harvest that you can kind of read about and watch. And they do change. They change based on the weather, whether it's hot, whether it's rainy, whether it's dry, depending on whatever's growing, they will move a bit. But in addition to that, the products that you know, those go into are being done earlier in some cases too, right? So yeah. you really do, to your point, want to plan this ahead. And I think it's worth spending some time on your weekends or at night and thinking about like, what did your year look like last year? Even the past 12 months, you don't need to do this at the end of the year. And look at where your low points were in volume for shipments and margin and go, okay, well, what products would be a great fit that starts shipping then? And then back the calendar up two, three months and then set a reminder for next year that that's when you want to start prospecting them because yep. sooner is much better than later. And before I continue on this list, because the next one is going to be clothing and footwear, um, sometimes the prospect is the actual shipper, is the actual shipper, right? But sometimes it's a another logistics company, possibly a freight forwarder that's going to bring this stuff in from overseas yes. and then pass it off to a broker or a trucking company for the domestic portion of it. So I want you to think about those two angles. Um, so for example, 
Um, Gap, I know a guy that Gap was a big customer of his in the past. Um, I also know people who uh, freight forwarders are big customers of theirs, and the freight forwarders customer is the retailer or the clothing line company. So in one way, shape, or form, whether it's direct or through a forwarder, you know, these are different ways you can prospect these commodities. But so clothing and footwear, right? Weather cools down, people start to purchase more warm clothes and footwear, sweaters, jackets, boots, hats, all that stuff, right? Your targets and all your retailers, they switch out all their stuff. And it's not just in the fall, it's every season. Every season. Right? So that's that's big stuff to think about. Um, well, to your point, I wanted to say something else. Yeah, go ahead. I want to say something else. I don't know if anyone, well, this is a recommendation. If you haven't, if you aren't following Jason Miller on LinkedIn, he works, I think, Adam, looking at his profile right now. He puts a lot of great stats on our industry out. He's a supply chain professor in East Lansing, Michigan. But why I bring him up was he did a really good analysis with a chart a few weeks ago on everybody thinks manufacturer is where you start to prospect. And he points out that like, we don't really make a lot of these things in the United States. The places that ship them are resellers or distributors. Just like you said, most of the products that are going to be shipped, everything that you mentioned came from overseas at one point, right? So you have multiple opportunities to actually prospect the same commodity. You can start with the freight forwarders, you can start with the containers, but you can also talk to the distributors and you can talk to the retailers, right? Like there are four or five prospects within just one supply chain of one article of clothing before they actually get to the store shelf. So yep. again, think also beyond maybe just the company type. And again, you always want to ask the question, where did it come from and where is it going to? If it's ending up in a consumer's hand, it likely stopped four or five places before it got to this place in the last stop. Yep. Um, all right, I'll wrap up my list kind of quick here. The home appliance and decorations. So obviously your, your holiday decorations, but also things like heaters, fireplaces, um, school supplies, right? Back to school. So depending on what state or part of the country you live in, it could start, that could be in August, it could be in September. Um, but the shelves are being stocked far in advance, right? Yes. Month or more in advance before back to school, you're going to start seeing a big surge of this, you know, basically like your office equipment type of commodities being uh, put on the shelves in your Walmarts and your Targets and your uh, office depots and things like that. Um, and lastly, sporting equipment, right? It's another seasonal thing. You're going to see more uh, skis and snowboards in the, in the fall and winter months, and you're going to see more um, water sports equipment when it comes to spring and summer. So just think about those seasonality wise. You know, there's a, a there's an, almost an endless amount of um, options of what to prospect as far as a commodity. I hope that that just gave you about three dozen little uh, you know ideas of things that you probably never you may have never thought of to prospect. I'll give you a big one too: Christmas trees, right? Like yep. real high margins. They ship <laughs> very they move short just like of time. Yeah, very short amount of time. But yep. they pay to move them because everyone that doesn't get moved is one that isn't sold and was a waste of a lot of effort and energy and money. So we'll yep. pay decent margins and is a great commodity, honestly, to start prospecting right now because they're starting to look at their carrier base. They're probably starting to get rates on things that they're going to be looking at for a month from now. And they're going to be packing those lots far ahead of Thanksgiving. Yep. That's that's exactly right. But good episode. Um We'll have Jeff on again at uh, some point later this year to talk about some other seasonal stuff later in the year. Ben, any final thoughts or things on your end? Not really, man. I mean, a lot of what we were talking about in here, I mean, outside pretty much everything we talked. I mean, I think we gave everyone a lot of different categories, a lot of different topics and niches to go after. I think the thing I do want to make a point to say, right, is that like, these are all great to think about and to research and to come up with leads. But all of that isn't worth anything if you're not going to pick up the phone and make enough phone calls consistently enough to actually turn all of these ideas 
into real business opportunities for you to move freight, right? So these are great to get you started, but do not spend so much time going through the rabbit hole researching that you're neglecting to actually pick up the phone and make enough activity to actually move the ball forward. It's a difficult market to close shippers. Anyone that's in it that's making these calls realizes it, but it is happening, right? You and I talk a lot about this off the show of people doing record months within brokerages, right? Like people yep. doing record weeks recently, like now. So, I mean, brokerages are successful. People are doing really well in this, but they're doing the things that we talk about, not just researching and trying to find the perfect lead before you call it. So, Yep. That's right, man. Can't stress it enough. You got to put the activity in. I saw... Um, I saw a funny statistic today, you know, like you get a bunch of ads on your Facebook or Instagram feed. And a lot of it's like, um, you know, it could be anything from learn how to do this or a course on how to do that or something fitness related. Right. And there's always like a disclaimer that like past results are not indicative of future outcomes or whatever. Um, Cause you could read a book or take a course or start, a new fitness regimen or whatever, if you don't actually apply everything or anything, you are not going to get results. So we're, we're prescribing to you the proper way to generate leads, to research and get educated on that commodity and the activity that you have to do to actually make the prospecting calls. If you don't do anything with this advice or guidance, it's worthless to you. But we know from feedback from people that they are taking our advice. Some of them are at least. So Ben, I couldn't agree with you more. You got to do it. Just got to do the work. Agreed. There's a funny stat. Like it's like the overwhelming majority of people don't finish a book that they actually start. And an even smaller percentage actually take the time to apply the things they even read in the first place. Right. So again, it all boils down to like, what are you really going to do with this? not how much of this can you consume and sit behind watching videos to just keep feeling like you're making yourself smarter. Like knowledge yeah. is great and it's a huge advantage, but that advantage doesn't mean shit if you're not going to apply it and do the hard things necessary to actually execute with it. Yep. Good stuff. You're absolutely right. All right. Good deal. Well, we'll see you guys on the next episode of Freight 360. Ben? Whether you believe you can or believe you can't, you're right. And until next time, go Bills. That wraps up this episode of Freight 360. Check out the show notes for links to anything that we've referenced on this episode. And make sure to visit us online at Freight360.net to see our entire library of episodes, videos, blogs, and more. And make sure to check us out on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel for daily and weekly tips and content. And if you'd like your question answered on the show, fill out the Contact Us form on our site and we'll see you next week.